Hi, uh, welcome to the Daily Bible Reading Show. Uh, didn't really feel like doing it live today. Uh, I know I missed the last couple of days and it's for the same reason. Uh, yeah, stuff's just been happening and my mind's just been occupied. So uh, I've been reading, just doing my own personal reading, but I thought um, let's just try doing it offline and I'll do a recording instead. Uh, there is a recording limit on this, so I can't go too long, so I'll have to be briefer than usual, but maybe that might be a good thing. So Saturday, 27th March, let's see, what is our reading for today? Bibleplan.org, load up, load up, load up, Exodus 38, John 17, Proverbs 14, Philippians 1, no, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to read all four. I'll tell you what, I'm going to start from... Uh, Philippians, work my way backwards in the four readings, see far, how far I get. So let's look at Philippians chapter 1. That's a new book at least, Philippians. Okay, this is Philippians chapter 1. I, I'm, I'll pray. Heavenly Father, thank you um, for your daily bread to us um, that we feed on and it sustains us, uh, help us to feed on this, to, to grow and to be sustained by it. Oh, sorry, I'm just... <laughs> my phone. Uh, help us to uh, savor it and to taste that the Lord is good. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I should really put this on silent. Okay, silent, silent. Okay, there we go. Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God and all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now and I'm sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both of my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Verse 12, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter... Uh, do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. But then, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers, and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. <laughs> If I'm to live in the flesh, this means fruitful labor for me, yet which shall I choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. Hmm. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, 
striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God, for it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engage in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Okay, oh, uh, yeah, okay, so this is a long chapter. I think, let's just focus on this one chapter. Um, sorry, I don't think I'll be able to do the other three, which were what, with your again, Exodus 38, John 17, Proverbs 14. Let's just focus on Philippians 1. Let's do a good job just trying to understand and trying to come to grips with the big picture of this passage. So Paul is writing to um, this church, calls them saints in Christ Jesus, verse 1 in Philippi. And this church, you know, uh, has overseers, has deacons, you know, has leaders. You know, Paul, he planted this church, he left it in good care. He appointed leaders, overseers, uh, elders, and deacons, servants. And uh, he calls themselves, uh, Paul and Timothy, uh, servants or slaves of Christ Jesus. So it's a very humble uh, term that he uses for himself. But, 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 I think this term as well, slave of God especially, it's uh, reminiscent of all the prophets. So all the prophets in the Old Testament were slaves of God, but here Paul and Timothy, they're slaves of Christ Jesus. And the Philippian church, they're saints of Christ Jesus, King Jesus. They're serving the same God. And yeah, um, he wishes them grace, peace. And he says, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. So verse three, he has been praying for them. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine, every time. He's always praying for this church, even though he is far away from them. Uh, he, he's always praying with joy and he's always thanking God for them every time he thinks of them. Because verse five, they are partners in the gospel from the first day until now. Partners, their um, uh, koinonia fellowship is a business term, kind of like you know you go into business with someone, you know you're selling noodles or something. <laughs> you're working alongside one another. I know a, a friend of mine. I really really respect him. Every time he preaches on it, he says you know this kind of partnership. It's not. Uh, it's not like. Uh, how, how do you do? It's not, it's not like, like this. Oh, hey, how are you? You're a partner with friends, right? We're, we're together in this. But rather, it's more side by side. That means you don't uh, necessarily need to be like buddy buddy, but you're focused on the same goal. You're both serving Christ. And you know, you're both going in the same direction. And you're working alongside one another. And I think that's such a good and healthy model. Um, you know, it, 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 it takes you out of that kind of mindset whereby it's just me and my ministry. But you know, everyone else is working towards that same goal. We might not be even in the same church. You know, Paul isn't, Paul's away from this church. But we're working uh, alongside one another. Uh, there are lots of brothers in arms. And we're going in the same direction and we're servants in the gospel, partnership in this gospel. And he says, I'm sure of this, verse six, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. So if they began in the first day, and he says all the way to the end, it's Jesus Christ who will sustain you, who will enable you to stand and to continue on all the way to the end, to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me, verse 7, to feel this way about all of you because I hold you in my heart. He's, he's sounding very emotional. He's almost justifying, hey, you know, Paul, you're, you're kind of emotional. You know, should you be saying these? Yes, of course, it is right for me to emote this way. I hold you in my heart. You know, you're all partakers with me of grace. And he says, both of my imprisonment and, of, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Oh, wow, okay. All right, so, uh, it's, he's talking about his suffering, you know, his imprisonment, but also his defense. His, every time he's, he's upfront, you know, he is doing mission work, he is putting himself in danger, 
he knows, you know, we're, we're together in this. Uh, and he knows, you know, these are guys who are uh, with me in spirit. They're praying for me. Uh, in all likelihood, they're supporting Paul as well. This young church, small church, uh, is supporting Paul financially and spiritually and through prayer. And he says, you know, you guys, you know, of course, you are with me. You are in my heart. And I think think there's this kind of relationship that's really good, you know, um, to have this kind of ministry connection with the people you're serving directly, you know, your pastor of this church, for instance, but also serving alongside, you know, to have that kind of like camaraderie, I guess. And verse eight, for God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with affection. It's almost as if you might not believe me, God will testify. God is my witness. How I long for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And verse nine, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may prove what is excellent and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. So he really talked about that uh, completion for the day of Christ. He talks about it again in verse 10, that you may be excellent may be pure for the day of Christ. You know, he's so concerned that they all make it to the end. Um, sometimes we, um, <laughs> I, I, I do this, I do this. You know, you, uh, it's, you're excited about someone when they first, you know, join your church, they first join your Bible study. Uh, and you know, you lose that excitement, you lose that connection as time goes on. Oh, this person is so bothersome. Paul is concerned for the other end of that journey that, you know, the people he witnessed to, he, he, he told the gospel to, that God began that journey and from day one, he's praying for them that they make it all the way to the end. That, you know, the love they had will abound more and more. The, the affection, the knowledge, their discernment, all the things that they know about Christ that will just grow more and more and more up until the end such that they make it all the way to that day, that blameless day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. We, we, you know, do you realize we're almost at the end of the academic year? You know, it's uh, March, coming to April soon, a couple of months more, and uh, students will be graduating uh, lots of friends will be leaving the country and it might be more important now than when we began the year. More important now to kind of like make sure that people make it all the way to the end. You know, what's waiting for them when they leave Cambridge? You know, uh, have they been growing and uh, abounding in this knowledge and love and insight as they did when they first heard the gospel? And Paul says, these guys have, but because he's also eager for them to do this, he's praying for them. And all this will bring glory and praise to God. You know, he goes, only God could have done this. And so he switches uh, gear in verse 12 to talk about his uh, suffering, <laughs> his imprisonment, verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what's happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. He's saying, you know, I'm in prison. Imagine Paul in prison, he has chains and stuff. Um, this is a good thing. <laughs> He's always saying, this is a good thing. Why? Because it has served to advance the gospel. In other words, more people are hearing about Jesus because I'm in prison. <laughs> How about that? Maybe, you know, your pastor is not in prison, or maybe he is. <laughs> but maybe your pastor is being bad mouth. Maybe he's in trouble, you know, uh, with the law. Paul is, that's why he's in prison. Uh, but as a result of that, more people are talking about the gospel. More people are hearing, hey, what's happened to this guy? Why is it that he's in, the he's in, he's in jail? It's because of this message, this gospel that he's proclaiming. Paul says, yay, that's a good thing. He says, and most of the brothers, verse 14, having become confident in the Lord because of my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word 
without fear. You know, these other brothers are saying, hey, Paul, look at him. He's willing to go to prison to, because for the gospel. No, hey, we sh what, what are we doing? Why, why, are we, <laughs> why are we so worried? You know, we should be even bolder. He says, because of this, the brothers are much more bold. And then he talks about motivation. Motiva verse 15, some indeed preach, preach, preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. So two mo motivations. Some are envying Paul, said, hey, you know, why is that guy's ministry growing so much? So now is my chance to grow my ministry because he's in jail. So envy, rivalry, they're com competing with Paul, trying to be the next Paul, apostle. But the others out of goodwill. Others are, hey, you know, we have to take Paul as our model. We have to do what he is doing, you know, be willing to speak the gospel, whatever the consequences. And he says, the second group, uh, they do it out of love. He said, they know that I'm here for the defense of the gospel. But the former, this first like competing, envious people, he says, they proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely thinking that they can afflict me in my imprisonment. They actually want to cause Paul more heartache because he's in prison. Say, ha ha ha, I'm not in prison. You are Paul, uh, aren't you? Uh, he's ho tama, you, you, you're, you're in such horrible condition. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy I'm not like you. But Paul says, I don't care. Why, oh no, verse 18, what then? Only that in every way, you know, the good way and the bad way, whether in pretense or in truth, whether fake or true, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. Paul is actually thanking God, not only for the people who empathize with him. Oh, you know, poor thing. You know, we are with you, Paul. You know, you're in prison, but don't worry, we're praying for you. He thanks God for them, but he even thanks God for the people who are envying him, who are talking bad behind his back. He says, I don't care because more people are hearing the gospel. Who cares? <laughs> see, you see how Paul really doesn't care about his own reputation, what people think of him. Now he cares that the gospel is preached. It's not that they are preaching a false gospel, another gospel. You know, they're getting the message right. Their motivations are a little bit suspect. But you know, Paul says, you know what? I don't care. You know, who, who cares? You know, they badmouth me but they proclaim Jesus, they praise God. Now, you know, obviously God is going to deal somewhat with their hearts in some way in the future. But you know what, Paul is saying, I don't care, you know, as long as more people hear about Jesus, more people trust in Him and they have their sins forgiven and they, you know, they receive that, that, that blessing of eternal life from God, you know, that's, that's good, that's good, praise God. And that's amazing. And he continues to say, yes, and I will rejoice it. Nothing is going to stop me from thanking God for this. He says, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that this will turn out for my deliverance. Says, oh, I know, I know for sure. You're praying for me to be delivered. It means to be released from prison. He says, that's going to happen. I'm certain of this because with the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, and then he says, verse 20, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, so that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. <laughs> now, now, wait, didn't he just say that he's going to be released? But he says, now I could die. You know, how, how do you reconcile verses 19 and 20? You know, 19 says, you know, I'm going to be released for sure because you're praying for me and Spirit of Christ is going to help me. But it says, I could die. And I think Paul is saying, either way, you know, uh, Jesus is going to be praised. Let me see if that's true. Because he says, verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Oh wow, okay, so he has this thing, I can die or I can live, and he says if I live, 
you know, that's a good thing, is Christ. That means I can keep on serving Christ. But if I die, somehow, yay, I gain. I gain something. Like, what does he gain? And he explains to us in verse 22. If I'm to live in the flesh, this means fruitful labor for me. <laughs> that means more work. <laughs> if I don't die, God is just going to give me more ministry, more opportunity, but more work, fruitful labor. And I mean, stuff that I do that will actually bear fruit. Um, and blah, 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 what is it? Yet I, which shall I choose? I cannot tell. <laughs> I am hard pressed bet between the two. Have you ever been stuck between two choices, uh, whether to live or to die? And it's not that uh, you want to live and you don't want to die, but you know, both seem good. <laughs> live, good. Die, even better. That, that's crazy, right? This guy. But he says here, let, let, let's, let's follow his train of thought. Uh, where is it already? I'm, I'm quite lost. Um, my desire, verse 23, my desire is to depart. Depart and be with Christ, which is far better. It says if I die, means I get to be with Jesus. And you know what, actually, you know, considering he, like, he's in prison, considering, you know, people are talking behind his back, I, I get what he's saying. You know, so actually, uh, he really loves the idea that, you know, the worst that can happen is I die, but then I get to be with Jesus. He says, that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Wow. So he, the reason why he's so confident that he's going to be released, he's not going to die, he's going to, it's because he says it's for your sake. It's not for my sake. He says he believes that God will keep him alive, release him from prison so that he can keep on serving you guys, you Philippians, for you, can remain and continue for you all, for, for you all, for your progress and for your joy. And that's why he says initially, you know, I'm eager, I, I'm, my eager expectation, you know, this will, uh, I will not be ashamed, you know, this will turn out for my deliverance, I'll be, I'll be released. It's because, you know, you're praying for this, and if I'm released, I can serve you some more. And so I'm pretty sure of that. But, 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 if I die, if this doesn't happen, yay, you know, actually, you know, I've, I fought a good fight, you know, I served Christ, and I'm just so much looking forward to being with Jesus again. So either way, you know, Paul has his priorities right. Either serve Jesus in life or be with Jesus in his death. And, you know, so he is talking about his suffering, but he ends by talking about your suffering. Your suffering. Okay, I've got seven more minutes. Try to, let's finish it in seven minutes. Verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or I am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. You know, Paul is saying, um, you know, whether I come and see you or not, that's not the point. The point is that you guys are together in the gospel. You're side by side. Again, it's that fellowship description. Again, side by side, you're serving alongside one another. You're going forward in serving Jesus Christ for the gospel. Verse 28, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. Wow. I wonder what this sign is. This is a clear sign. Somehow you look at this sign, therefore they know that those guys are not only wrong, they're going to be destroyed, but you're going to be saved and God's going to do the saving for you. It might be this one-mindedness, I think. You know, this togetherness in the gospel or living a life that is worthy of the gospel. You know, you're constantly thinking, oh wow, you know, this gospel has saved me with my grace. I don't deserve this. And I know it's only by grace. It's not that I'm trying to err in this salvation. But there is a fruit that comes from receiving this grace. And I, I want it to bear fruit in me. And what this fruit looks like, among other things, you know, love and faith, is this togetherness. You know, here we're in it together. You know, you ever feel like that with your Bible study group? We are in this together. Suffering or speaking, you know, we're in it together. 
And he says, verse 29, sorry, a few more minutes ago, I'll try to finish this. For it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for him, engage in the same conflict you saw I had, and now here I still have. So it has been granted or gifted or grace to you, two things, to believe in Christ, and that's how you become a Christian, right? God gave you this gift of trusting in Him and you receive eternal life and relationship with Him and love from Him. That's it. But hey, that's another gift. Not only this, but also to suffer <laughs> for Christ. You go, uh, the first gift is good. The second one, maybe uh, it's okay, God. <laughs> that's okay. But Paul says, engage in the same conflict, same struggle I, you saw me have. So, so Paul is almost modeling this second gift to them. He says, you know, I'm, I'm displaying to you just how wonderful actually to have this second suffering gift because it gives you this confidence that this gospel is true, that this reward of being with Christ, even if you lose your life, you be, this is true. And therefore, this is a gift that God has given you, not only to trust in Christ, but in your life, in your witness, in your attitude, you know, you are able to display this faithfulness in your pain and your suffering and your rejection and people talking behind your back, all that. You display that you're suffering in the same way that Jesus suffered. People talk behind his back. People hated him. People rejected him for the wrong reasons, but it showed that he trusted in God. He had the approval of God. And it's the same way with us. That's the same thing we see with Paul. That's hopefully the same thing that you see in one another. And I wonder if you, you can see that there's a kind of fellowship in suffering together as brothers and sisters of Christ. Wow, heavy stuff, right? Uh, no wonder we can only cover one passage today, but very challenging, very, very challenging. Almost crazy, you can say, of Paul to be telling people that this is the reason why he's rejoicing that other people are talking behind his back. He says, who cares? As long as the gospel goes forward. And Paul is saying, you guys should have the same attitude, this same kind of view together with me because we have this partnership in the gospel. We have this same gift from Jesus Christ to trust in him, to suffer for him. So let's live for him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Paul's example in ministry, but also in life that he calls us <laughs> to partner together with him, to partner together with Christ in telling others about this wonderful news in the gospel. Lord, um, thank you that we're not alone. Thank you that we have friends and brothers and sisters who struggle alongside with us. When you look alongside us, we see them you know, and in that same struggle, going towards that same direction. And maybe we even see Jesus <laughs> with us, you know, helping us with that yoke that is light and easy that He bears on our behalf. So Lord, um, help us to keep taking those steps of faith, of ministry, of service, such that we make it all the way to the end, uh, blameless all the way to that day of Christ, and that we might see you face to face. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.